Now it's time for a U.S. report regular, former White House chief of staff and senior advisor at Bondi Partners, Mick Mulvaney. Mick, thanks so much for joining us again this week. And firstly, I would love to get your thoughts on Ron DeSantis and this little road tour he's been doing. Yeah, uh, James, it's great to see you again. You look fabulous again this week. I won't ask you this time uh, who you're wearing. Um, these these trips that uh, that DeSantis is on are very typical of people who are preparing to sort of run for office. In fact, oftentimes in this country, they'll start this a year or two before they decide to announce for president. So it's not at all uncommon. They're big media markets, which is good for Ron DeSantis. They're big donor markets. Even though Chicago, New York City are heavily Democrat areas, there's a lot of Republican money there. So it's not unusual for a potential Republican candidate to go to these areas. Plus, the message that he's delivering is really solid for Republican primary um, electorate, which is you know, uh, law and order and, you know, uh, traditional American values, safety, that type of stuff. This is easy ground to plow. So um, it's not at all surprising. Ron is not the only one doing it, by the way. Um, Tim Scott, good friend of mine as well, was in Iowa this week doing pretty much the same thing, sort of trotting out messages, practicing to see what sells and what doesn't uh, right before you get ready to make an announcement that you're running for president. And I mean, Mick, you know, you talk about there his uh, Republican money in New York and Chicago and all of these places, but also what we've seen, you know, I think pretty much since the riots in 2020 uh, and beyond uh, has been the basic fall apart of that Democrat urban model. And it's becoming more and more clear, I think, to a lot of Americans that that way of governance doesn't work anymore. Does this present uh, an existential threat to the Democrats come the next presidential election, or is that going to be the damage from that going to be confined to those urban localities? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's an existential threat. I mean, left-wingers have been making this mistake since the left-wing existed, right? Go back to the Soviet <laughs> Union, Venezuela, Cuba. I mean, these, these places fail, right? It's what we expect California and Illinois and New York to do and what they're doing. It's why there, you saw this, uh, so many people leaving New York to go to Florida. Millions of people left California to go to Texas as well for similar reasons. So I don't know if it's an existential threat as much as it is the, the argument that Republicans want to have that Democrats don't want to have. The Democrats don't want to have that side-by-side -side comparison that DeSantis is bringing to the fore, which is, this is how Florida handled it, and this is where we are now, and this is how your state, New York, this is how your state, Illinois, so your state, California, handled it, and here are the difficulties you are facing now in terms of crime, in terms of economic malaise, in terms of homelessness, uh, all those sorts of things. It's the side-by-side -side comparison that the Democrats really don't want, which is why you saw that tweet from the mayor of New York City uh, who want to talk about things like LGBTQ and abortion and so forth, because they don't want to talk about the harsh realities of that side-by-side -side comparison. That reminds me so much of that debate between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton when Hillary pivoted very hard left to the woke identity politics to short circuit Bernie Sanders' uh, economic message. And I think we're seeing a lot of that same cynicism in that tweet. But I want to move on to Trump. And we spoke earlier on the show about his latest visit to East Palestine, Ohio. Now, I think it was a good move uh, because it not only showed up the Biden administration being flat-footed on this, but also um, it meant he was not attacking Ron DeSantis and other Republicans. Do you think Donald Trump is starting to get his mojo, his focus back after a lot of weeks of very scattershot efforts? Yeah, I mean, certainly this is a huge success, right? This is a big deal. He got there before anybody from the Biden team did. Imagine that. It's an out, he's, he's, he's an out-of-power president down at his house in Mar-a-Lago, and yet he's able to get to... Uh, Ohio at the scene of this this terrible tragic accident before any senior member of the Biden administration could make it. So it was a huge coup for him. And you're right to pick up on the fact that he wasn't talking about other Republicans. He was talking about Democrats. And that's, you know, that's sort of what a lot of the Republican base wants to see from all of their candidates, which is why are we beating up on each other when it's so easy to beat up on the other side? And of course, that's what the fight is all about at the end of the day anyway. You can elect pretty much any Republican you want to, and you're going to get similar policies. Not exactly the same. Similar policies, different personalities for sure, but similar policies. It's The question is, what policies do they bring to the table vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats? And that's what Trump was able to do. So he's out on the road. Uh, DeSantis is out on the road. Nikki Haley's on the road. Tim Scott's out on the road. And everybody's having a pretty good week. Uh, but I think Trump, yeah, if you had to think, did he win the week? Yeah, I think he probably did. And I mean, I want to ask you about this, because you used to be a White House chief of staff. Strategically, 
What was going on, do you think, in the Biden administration and in the White House there that they thought, OK, well, Joe Biden's going to Ukraine. He can't go. But why wouldn't they send when there's all this media noise? Why would they let the field be vacated? Let first J.D. Vance go and then J Donald Trump go and leave the field open to Republicans to keep using this as an issue to beat them up with? Is there any strategy happening at the White House or what is working? Uh, what was what's going on there, do you think? You know, James, that's what I love about this show. You've got insights from afar that a lot of folks here miss. Okay? No one's asked for that question yet. There's a, there's a good answer to that question, which is, keep in mind, you have a brand new chief of staff. Okay? Jeff Science has only been on the job a couple of weeks, and you had a president who was absent. Okay? So most of the leadership is over in Poland. Zainz is probably on the trip with him. And there's nobody here running the show. And since Zainz is new, he hasn't sort of built that infrastructure back in the White House to run the place while the rest of the team is gone. So it's sort of a, a failure of management. It's a management crisis. And there's nobody who picked up the phone and told Buttigieg to go. And got you got to put yourself in Pete Buttigieg's shoes as well. You know, if, if he wants to run for president very badly, and if Joe Biden doesn't, he's on the short list of Democrats who will. So so why would he go out of his way to make Biden look good unless someone's telling him to do it? So there's all sorts of internal chaos with the Democrats right now. Some of it is on purpose. Some of it is because other folks want to be president. And a lot of it is probably by accident because they have a new leadership team in that's not ready to do it, but it's a huge, not ready to take over, but a huge failing for them this week to let Republican senators and a former Republican president get to this, is, this accident site before any significant Democrats made it. Indeed. Now, Mick, I want to pick up on something that you said a moment ago, though. You said that you elect any of these Republicans, and you're more or less going to get a similar sort of suite of policies. But I think you're right about domestic policy. But this week, we also saw Donald Trump give a very dark vision about foreign policy. Uh, he talked about being on the brink of World War III. He was very condemnatory of the State Department and, you know, the Pentagon and a lot of officials uh, in, in Washington. He's going to have a very different foreign policy to, say, a Nikki Haley or a Mike Pompeo if he runs. Is there going to be a big debate about foreign policy internally within the Republicans between, I guess you could say, the America Firsters and, you know, whatever the neoconservative movement that's more interventionist and globalist uh, has evolved into? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I hadn't thought much about that. But as I sit here and, and, and go through it in my head, I think to myself, you're absolutely right. Trump is going to be more non-interventionist. Pompeo will be more aggressive, more traditionally conservative Republican in, in, in sort of getting involved overseas. And it's sort of hard to say where Nikki could be. You think Nikki might be more towards Pompeo, but she's also gone back and forth on a couple other issues as well. She's trying to cater to the MAGA crowd and then also cater to the to the donor class. So she's, you know, she's having some difficulty finding her feet on those is, on, on those sorts of things. So yeah, you might get a variety of foreign policy issues. By the way, I think uh, everybody would be about the same on Australia and China. Keep in mind the Pacific sort of unites both parties and certainly unites Republicans. So I don't think you'll see a change of policy towards Pacific China, um, uh, the uh, AUKUS countries, the, 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 the Quad countries. You won't see that kind of change. But in Ukraine, in relationship with our traditional um, European allies, yeah, I think you might see some variety. And that will be interesting to watch as each of them tries to find something to sort of distinguish them from the crowd of six or eight or 10 Republicans who might be running. Interesting stuff. But now, finally, there's been a report in Politico this week. Now, I don't know how much of this is just noise and speculation looking for a headline, but they said that there's growing speculation that Joe Biden's not going to run, uh, that the February deadline for him to announce has come and gone. Now they're talking about April, but they say there's a problem that Democrats are having a problem drumming up a possible plan B. Now, should we take this with a grain of salt? Or is there a really a chance that Joe Biden is indeed, as we have suggested many times on this show, going to pull the pin? Yeah, you know, the pendulum goes back and forth. You and I have talked about that before. You know, sometimes he looks really good to run. Sometimes it looks like there's no chance he's going to run. It's gone back and forth several times, depending upon his fortunes at that particular time. Right now, the pendulum has swung against him. Axios is a left-leaning publication. So when they're publishing reports saying that he might not run, it's not like Fox News coming out with wishful thinking. That's folks who have contacts inside the Democrat Party and inside the White House. So I take that um, with a lot more credibility than I might from another outlet. So, mm. look, he's struggled. He really mm. has. I, I know we show the pictures of him, you know, falling up the steps, but that's because he's shuffling his feet when he walks. Watch him walk. Uh, and watch him walk in, his, in the video from Ukraine. He shuffles like 
like unfortunately my mom did when she started to, to, to get dementia. This is this is a traditional thing that happens to folks when they start to lose some of their abilities. And I think everybody sees it. I think the family sees it. I think the Democrats see it. The reason they have a difficulty with plan B right now is because no one wants to be the person that sort of pushes Joe Biden out. No one wants to be seen as the bad guy. Biden is the Biden team, probably Jill Biden, his wife, is gonna have to lead the effort here to say, look. For whatever reasons, Joe Biden is not going to run, and then Plan B will present itself. You can't have a Plan B go first, because that person will be perceived as the person who pushed Joe Biden out, and that is an unforgivable sin.